Hello everyone and welcome back to the channel as well as back to part two of painting out every single Daniel Smith watercolor. For those of you who might have missed the first part last week, we did the first two pages of the 238 dot card, but the dot cards are not the only colors that Daniel Smith has. So in addition to this, I've also um, accrued other assortments of colors that are not included on their dot charts, including a couple that they only have available for sale online or in their shop, as well as some colors that they have retired. So we're going to be taking a look at the second two pages today, and let's go ahead and jump on in. I'm so glad that you guys seem to enjoy the first page swatch through as much as I did creating it, and uh, I hope to continue the fun today because we are entering my favorite page of Daniel Smith colors, and that is the Earth Tones. So we saw a bit of the bright greens on the last page, and this one is going to have some of the more earthy greens. And then just to remind you of a couple of the logistical things with this video, this paper is not the best that they have their dot cards on, and so it's not a perfect representation of the colors, but hopefully this video will serve as a good starting point for you guys to do your own research on which colors to use. The dot cards are really invaluable resources to go ahead and be able to see these all for yourself in person. So I have linked the dot card on Amazon, which is about $22 USD, so that if you're interested, you can go ahead and get one for yourself. Using the Amazon links in the description, of course, help out this channel by giving a small percentage back to me and the channel um, to help creating videos, but don't feel obligated to use it if this video is good enough for your research purposes. So the first two colors here are Zyocyte, I'm not, not sure if I'm saying that correctly, but Zyocyte Genuine, which is a Primatech color, and then we're following that up with Olive Green. Olive Green is made from PY97, which is a mid-tone yellow. Then we've got PBR, uh, I'm sorry, PB29, so that is Ultramarine Blue, and PBR7, which is either one of the Siennas or one of the Umbers, if I had to guess. Maybe it is one of the Siennas, so a burnt Sienna or a raw Sienna to make that tone. I'd have to do some playing around to, to know for certain. Then we have green gold, which we talked a little bit about in the last color spotlight series. There is a single pigment version of this color that we're going to see in just a moment here um, from PY129 that most companies call green gold. Daniel Smith's green gold is uh, not the same. It is a combination of colors and it makes this beautiful bright green gold color. It's made from um, Nickel Azo Yellow, which we'll see in just a moment, PY3, which is Hansa Yellow Light, and PG36, which is Thalo Green Yellow Shade. There we go. Then next we have Rich Green Gold, and this is PY129, the single pigment version that most companies call green gold. We did that whole color spotlight on this video, so you're welcome to go ahead and check that out if you are interested in learning more about it. It's a really neat mixing color. Then we have Nickel Azo Yellow, which was actually the color spotlight before Rich Green Gold. They're actually very similar colors in terms of the tones that they mix. Obviously with the Nickel Azo ye Yellow being a little bit more on that orangey side. How have all of you guys been? Have you had a good week? I'm going to be alternating hopefully in uh, October trying to get videos out twice a week. I know the last couple weeks though have only been one video a week so it's gonna kind of ebb and flow here but uh, I'll try and get you a little bit more content. Uh, the bronzite here is going to be a difficult color to rewet so I'm gonna put a little bit of water on it we'll come back to it. And we're gonna skip down to the Verona Gold Ochre. It was really fun to hear your comments about the colors that you guys enjoyed from the last pages. And as a reminder, the full high resolution scans are available for all of my patrons over on Patreon. If you missed it in the last video as well, I also have a Patreon special. It'd be nice if I could 
talk with words today. This Verona Gold Ochre is hard to re-wet, so that's why I'm spending so much time on it. I just want to make sure you guys can see the full potential of the color. Uh, but that special over on Patreon is during the month of October. If you sign up for the $15 or $25 tiers, in addition to all the other awesome stuff that is already included, like real-time tutorials and live stream, which is going to be this upcoming Saturday, uh, the 20th at 1 p.m. if you want to join us for that. There is also a promotion for a free print that is exclusively available only for patrons. So I'm really excited to be bringing that to you. It's a lion print that I did a tutorial on for my patrons as well. So if you join Patreon, you'll also get to see how to paint that yourself. And uh, yeah, I'd love to see you guys over there. There is a, another paint color here not really sure. It's one of the more red tones. It's interfering a little bit with this French ochre, but I'll try and get a good saturation of this up top so you can see its mass tone. I assumed that this was the same color, so I painted over it, but it is not, and I should have avoided it instead. I don't know if it's one I can push out of the way, or I'm just, I'm just making it worse. Yep, just making it worse. <laughs> All right, Daniel Smith does have, uh, we talked about this last time, they have more colors than any other brand of watercolor paint. They have more Primatech colors, and they also have a lot of different versions of earth tones, which if you are like me and love earth tones, you actually find to be quite exciting. It can be hard to choose between the different ones. I know that I had to choose, like I went back and forth, like which yellow ochre type color do I pick, because there's lots of available options. Um, so on and so forth, but I do like how much variety they have compared to other brands, and uh, it's really neat to be able to see the whole range of what our earth pigments have to offer. Bronzite Genuine, uh, being a Primatech color, it has great ratings and everything, so light fastness, light staining, um, it's transparent, it's also a glittery pigment. So we talked about this a little bit on the last page with like amethyst and cyclorite and things like that. Bronzite Genuine is another one that is going to shine a little bit. Then we have Burnt Bronzite Genuine, which is this pigment, but it is roasted. This is actually really lovely. Um, I don't remember being very impressed with these colors on the first pass. I'll pull up my last swatch card in a second so I can compare. But it's uh, very much a burnt sienna-like color, and it's got a little bit of a shimmer to it. Not quite as bold as some of the other ones, but still really neat. Let's see what it looked like before. Oh, wow. Okay, so this is the sample I had before, which looks completely different. My guess is that I didn't let this reconstitute as much, but I mean, this is just like night and day between the differences in the colors, and I, I really like this one, whereas this one I'd be like, oh, pass for sure. Uh, the Bronze Eye Genuine also looks uh, more yellow. Like this is more of a brown tone to me. This is more yellow. And I think that you're going to get that. I can't say for certain I'm not a pigment chemist or anything like that. Um, but, sorry, a car went by and was making a lot of noise. Um, but I think because they're made of natural stones, there's going to be some level of variation in them because when you get new pigments or new sources, they're going to differ just slightly. So that is my guess. This looks like there's another intruder. I'm gonna try and paint around it so it doesn't bleed out too much. This is Raw Sienna Light. I believe this was one of their 2017 colors. It is a semi-transparent yellow ochre type color. This is made from PY42, so it is yellow ochre, the yellow ochre pigment rather than a PBR7. And I wasn't super blown away with this the first time I saw it. I'm not super blown away with it now. It's good. It's probably uh, a bit brighter than the 
traditional yellow ochre that we'll take a look at in a second. So depending on which hue you're looking for, um, this might be a good choice. Um, also, this one here is PY43. So both PY43 and 42 are used kind of interchangeably for yellow ochres, but they can vary a lot, obviously, as we see here in their hue. Sometimes though, they can look exactly the same. So we're gonna see some more of those here. Like I said, they've got lots of options, especially in this range. So this first one here, burgundy yellow ochre. Aha, I remember now I had a piece of paper last time, didn't I, to protect these little blobs of paint. I was wondering what that sheet of paper was doing on my desk, and that's what happens when I don't record things back to back. <laughs> uh, anyway, we have burgundy yellow ochre here. This is also made from PY43, right? Yes. <laughs> this is also a transparent version of a yellow ochre. This one's got some more earthiness to it that I really enjoy in a yellow ochre. The reason I choose to have yellow ochre on my palette is because I like the earthiness. And if I want a yellow type of color like this, I typically will go with like a Nicolazzo yellow or some brighter or a quinacridone gold, something like that. And I find I don't need both of those on one palette. Then we've got their True Yellow Ochre, which is now made from PY43. I believe the version that they had when I first started painting was PY42 and they switched it. But this is my favorite, even after trying all these different versions over the years, I still go back to Yellow Ochre. It might be a first love type of situation, but it just is what it is. It's a little bit more on the brown side. All of these are series one, so there isn't a price difference. You can just pick whichever one you like best. Um, and I think I'll go ahead. I have one more here, I guess, and then I'll switch over. I have another one that is a discontinued pigment on my other sheet, my specialty sheet. Mars Yellow is one that I um, thought about for a really long time. I'm like, ooh, should I get Mars Yellow instead of Yellow Ochre? It's less transparent than the other versions, but it's just got this richness to it that's really beautiful. I still don't think I've painted anything with it, but I do think it's a really beautiful choice, at least here on the swatch card, for whatever that can tell us. Um, I will say, if you want to learn more about yellow ochre, I know a lot of people don't like the color. If you ever missed it, Sade from Sadie Saves the Day and I did a collab where we swapped channels on our different video. Uh, we swapped videos for our channel. So my color spotlight type series episode is over on her channel. I'll go ahead and link that up here for you so you can go ahead and check it out if you would like to. I just dropped a big dollop of water on my page and I knew that was going to happen as soon as I picked up my paintbrush, but it did it anyway. <laughs> um, so yeah, I know that one isn't as highly watched as my other series, but it is in the playlist and you can definitely go ahead and check that out. Okay, the one I want to show you over here, actually I think I have two. Cricut, really? We're going to we're gonna rustle the blinds during a recording? All right, we have a transparent gold ochre that a viewer sent to me see if it'll focus for you. It is made from PY43 and this was a limited edition color I believe based on the information that was given to me when this was sent. I did try and look it up online and I literally couldn't find anything like no archived sites. It wasn't on Jane Blundell's site at least from what I could find. So if you have more information on this transparent gold ochre let me know. It's no longer available but I thought I would show it to you just for fun. Oh my gosh, that's gorgeous. I wonder why that was a limited edition color. It's PY43. I wonder if it was a really specific variety that they were using for that one. It's got a gorgeous glow to it. I mean, if you look to, at it next to this quinacridone gold, we'll wait for it to dry, but it's got a luminosity that the other versions of PY43 are lacking. Even the raw sienna light that I was talking about earlier. I like this one better. The other one I wanted to do while we've got this out here is 
One that I was surprised to see when my local store was going out of business, I found this on the shelf and I was like, oh my gosh. And I messaged Eve right away and I was like, do you know about this color? And Eve did know about this color. She has this color. And uh, I didn't end up picking up a tube of it, but it's one of the Primatech colors. It's called Yavapai Genuine. And it's kind of an earthy, oh, maybe it's a little darker than the ones that we've been using. I was thinking it was more of um, an ochre color. But uh, it's fine, we can do that right now. We'll get to it eventually. It's got a richness to it. We talked about this in the last video where some of the colors are rated transparent and I would say they're maybe more semi-transparent. This does have a heavier feel to it, but it's really nice. It doesn't have a sparkle or anything, but it'll be interesting to compare it to some of our other browns when we get there. All right, let's keep going. So a lot of the questions I get asked about yellow ochre, have to do with raw sienna as well. Do I recommend getting a raw sienna or a yellow ochre? I personally tend to use yellow ochre more often in palettes, not because I don't like raw sienna. And I think, like I think Daniel Smith's version is beautiful here. It's got such a richness to it. Uh, but I usually have a burnt sienna on my palette. I've got other earth tones on my palette. And I find that this hue can be mixed with the yellow ochre with a bit of the uh, burnt sienna in it so I prefer not to dedicate a whole spot to it just because I often can mix it from other ones but it is really beautiful if you don't need an earth yellow you can go with this kind of light brown hue instead then we've got quinacridone gold of course this is going to be the new version of the color made from PY 150 and PO 48 Oh, I forgot to mention, um, the raw sienna is PBR7. I'm gonna wait for this to dry before I show you the comparison with the other quinacridone gold because while it's wet, you're just not gonna be able to see the true representation of how they look when they dry. This version is a little bit more intense though. It doesn't have quite the same earthiness as the original quinacridone gold did. I'm gonna take a little sip of water I'm trying out some some new chocolate. I've tried not to keep sweets in the house for a while now. I'm trying to cut out sugar um, primarily from my diet so that I can cut down on some inflammation with my, my uh, chronic pain and everything. But I found some chocolates that actually Jennifer Charlie introduced me to a while back when I was visiting her from Lily's and they are sweetened with um, the front says stevia, but there's also like erythritol in it and dextrin, I think. And one of the three, I don't know which one, gives me kind of like a fuzzy tongue, dry mouth type of feeling. So I didn't know that. I ate it and now I have to record the video. So I might be stopping a little more often than usual to take a sip of water. All right, the trans yellow oxide we go through our colors. This one is made from PY42. This also has a nice, uh, nice earthy brown quality to it. And then I'm on the Mount Amiata Natural Sienna. And this is another one that I was debating with the yellow ochre, the Mars yellow, and this one here. Again, I find that this is actually um, a pretty comparable, I mean, not comparable, nothing compares, right? <laughs> but it's a pretty comparable color to quinacridone gold um, in terms of its kind of brightness to it, although it will get a little bit more dull as it dries. Um, it's definitely got more luminosity than these other two, but again, I pick a yellow ochre for its earthiness rather than its luminosity, so I keep going back to the yellow ochre. Um, here you can see this one has started to dry a bit more. This one is much more orange whereas this one is a little bit more yellow and muted. 
This Mars Yellow, though, I'm a little confused at because... Oh, nope, okay. Maybe I'm just not remembering properly. I, I was thinking it was more yellow, and I guess it is more yellow than the Yellow Ochre, but it's definitely not bright yellow per se or anything like that. All right, then we are down to Hematite Burnt Scarlet. This is a Primatech, but I think it re-wets okay. Yep, so we don't have to wait for it this time. This is really lovely. This is one I feel bad. I wasn't sure if this was on the chart or not, uh, and I asked, I asked Grace to pick me up some when they got the samples for me. But thank you, thank you anyway, I'll make good use of it. This is, I would say, somewhere between a burnt umber and a burnt sienna. A little more earthy quality to it. And actually now, I'm gonna hold this up, you can actually see the shimmer a lot better in the bronzite. And the burnt bronzite actually has a lot more that came through as it was drying. You guys see that? I really like this burnt bronze. I, I don't know what I would use it for, but it's really pretty. Then we have, um, I think these are the last two ochre light colors. I don't know why the burnt hematite scarlet is in the middle of things, um, but this is environmentally friendly yellow iron oxide. I don't know about this color specifically, but I know that the other environmentally friendly colors that I've used um, that we'll look at later on this page, I believe that they're made from like sludge left over from iron deposit mine things or whatever. So like they're, they're making use of something that would be a waste product otherwise, which I think is really cool. You can definitely tell that this is less of a yellow ochre and more of a burnt sienna like tone but I would say it's closer in hue to one of like the PR 101 uh, burnt siennas versus a PBR 7 except there is granulation in there uh, Goethite brown ochre is one of Jane Blundell's favorite colors and I'm sure many of you already know that this is another one I debated about for a really long time on whether or not I wanted to add it to my palette. Same old, same old, like you've heard me say before, I just decided that the other colors fit my style a little bit better and provided the versatility I was looking for. But this is very much, um, I would say, comparable with a raw sienna. The raw sienna is a bit warmer, but otherwise they're kind of in that same range of colors. Next, we have Quinacridone Gold Deep. This is going to be a little bit closer to the PO48. I really wish they put the, like, the Quinacridone Gold, the Quinacridone Gold Deep, and the Quinacridone Burnt Orange next to each other, because they're pretty perfect gradient, given that they're all made from the same types of pigments. It's a lovely color, but I prefer just to have the Quinburnt Orange on my palette. Next we have Italian Deep Ochre, and this one is again, oh, this one's also made from PY43, so I guess we're not done with them yet. <laughs> this, uh, nope, there's a burnt, yeah, yeah, they just, they got a lot of yellow ochres, they like their ochres. a very transparent version. No heaviness at all. Trying to get a little bit more built up in this mass tone here. Lunar Earth. This is one that I know a lot of people don't use. It's made from PBR 11 but I've kind of fallen in love with it lately. It's it's kind of a burnt sienna-like hue, but it has this really 
like severe is the only word I can think of uh, granulation to it. I don't know if it's going to show up on this paper, so I'll do another swatch of it for you guys. So you can see on the arches, but it's really crazy how much this color granulates. So I can pull up a piece of paper here. It's really easy to re-wet too. And I'll show you guys this a little bit later once it's had a time to dry, but it, it separates so much. It's really pretty. I used it in my African Wild Dog painting. I've used it in a couple others lately. It's really fun. This is called Burnt Yellow Ochre, and I believe it's also made with... Oh, interesting. This might be the wrong color. I've had them do that before. Um, on my last chart, they switched up. Hmm. I don't know if I should do it while you guys are like watching the video and have like this big pause or if I should look it up afterwards. Let me grab my other sheet. We'll see. Oh, no. Okay. It's just that color. Uh, it's made from PR 102. I'm just trying to figure out the naming situation with it, why it's called burnt yellow ochre if it's PR 102. And also I want to show you the chart here. That looks like yellow ochre, right? It's not the same color. <laughs> so I'm not sure what's going on here. Um, so another reason why it's so good to have your own charts in, your per in, per in front of you because these aren't always representative of what you actually are getting. But that one is a little bit further off than I feel like it ought to be. If anyone has that color at home, let us know. I think that's the right one based on the pigment that's in it. PR 102 is a reddish tone. Just interesting. Again, I wouldn't call this transparent, maybe semi-transparent, but it's got a heaviness to it. Next, we've got uh, Garnet Genuine. This is made from Garnet Stone. It's a really beautiful red like an earthy red pigment. This one is almost identical to another color they have. I'm sure I'll be able to figure it out eventually. But let me just take a look at this really quick. Uh, Quinn Burnt Scarlet. If you guys can see those two colors next to each other, I'm running out of hands, but right there. Those two colors are very, very similar to each other. One is a Primatec, one isn't. We'll get to it eventually. We can compare them. Then we have French, or uh, sorry, roasted French ochre. So we had burgundy ochre up here. We have Verona gold ochre over here. I don't know if there's a regular, oh, here's French ochre. There we go. So theoretically, is it this color, but burned? Mm -hmm. This whole page is confusing me. I don't know. I'm not going to keep looking for it because I don't want you guys to be bored waiting. Oh, there it is. French Rose Joker. It's PR 102 again. Huh. They're pretty colors, I just don't understand the naming. I'm sure some of you guys can shed light. You always seem to comment and, and let us know. Then we've got Burgundy Red Ochre, also PR 102. So with the exception of the garnet that's thrown in the middle, again, not sure why it's thrown in the middle. One, two, and three are all made from the 102. This is again labeled as transparent and I just don't agree with that. It's got a heaviness to it. Mm. 
And it may seem while I'm painting all these out and having these criticisms and yeah, I don't understand some of the naming and some of the ratings are confusing. First off, I'll say that a lot of brands have inconsistencies like that Mgram is another one that I love the paints, but their, their rating systems aren't exactly clear or easy to follow. But when I say that Daniel Smith is my favorite brand of paint to paint with, it just, there's a feeling about it when you're painting with it that just has this ease that I really, really love for my style. It just fits really well. Um, so even though I might have criticisms here, it doesn't mean that I don't love the brand of paint and vice versa. There's paints that I really love on a swatch card that I just don't end up using. Sennelier is one of them that the paint is great. It's a fine brand and the colors are lovely, but I just don't find myself reaching for them as often. Here we have Venetian and Indian Red. The pair are both made from PR 101, but you can see that they turn out to be different colors. Both of them are rated as opaque. And this one has more of those purple undertones. This one is more red. This is gonna be closer to, um, if you've heard people talk about uh, Caput Mortem, um, like from Windsor and Newton, it's gonna be that type of color. Then we've got uh, Italian Burnt Sienna. And for those of you guys who have tried Daniel Smith's Burnt Sienna and don't care for it because it's a little bit different color, um, this is the color that you're probably going to like more. So a lot of people like the PR 101 or uh, brighter versions of PBR7 for your Burnt Sienna. And uh, this is gonna be that version for you. It's still made from PBR7, but it has an orangeness to it that the Burnt Sienna from them lacks. And we'll talk about the characteristics of that other Burnt Sienna when we get there. But if you've tried Daniel Smith's Burnt Sienna and you don't like it, give this one a try and I think you'll be happy. Next, we've got Quinn Burnt Orange. So I le at least, I guess, the Quinn Burnt Orange and the Quinacridone Gold Deep are next to each other so we can see the differences there. When I first paint this out, it is gonna be very, very vibrant, although I will let you know that this does lose some of that intensity as it dries. My box is a little far over. Oops. Then we have Quinacridone Sienna, which is made, oh, this is a three pigment blend. It's PO48, which is this one here, PR209 and PY150. It's a super intense red orange. I have a feeling this is another color that Tori would like. She loves her warm reds. It reminds me a bit, not identically, but it reminds me a bit of transparent pyro orange. So I can get that for you. This one's here by my thumb. So the transparent power orange is more red and this is more orange, but it has that, that type of quality to it. Then we've got Pompeii Red. This is another PBR7. A little bit hard to re-wet. Then we've got red fuchsite. That one's gonna be hard to re-wet. And then Minnesota Pipestone. I think 
Even though this one doesn't look dry, I remember it being hard to re-wet on the last one. So I'm gonna go ahead and leave a dot there as well. And we'll go down to C Sedona Genuine. Sedona always makes me think of country music. I grew up on country music. I do believe this is from Arizona, this pigment mine. And where is it on the chart? Oh, you know what? I think that I can't find these because um, the Primatech ones are on the back side of the thing and I'm not gonna flip it over to do that, but. I don't think it has information on where they're from anyway. You gotta look on the website for that. This is Italian Venetian Red. It's made from PR101. And it's uh, similar to a Venetian Red, but it's gonna be less opaque and have a little bit less tinting strength. So if you find Venetian Red is too overpowering for you, but wanna try that hue, this one could be fun to play with, but I have not used it myself in application. Definitely less opaque than the other version. Red Fuchsite Genuine up here is another sparkly color. There's been lots of talk on recent videos with Otto's Primatech series about um, what to use sparkly colors for and that kind of thing. And they've come up with a lot of good ones about like the blues and the purples being good for night skies and snow and things like that. But I don't remember if I've seen anyone talk about the sparkly browns. What do you guys use those for? This Minnesota Pipe Stone, it's rewetting more than the first chart that I did, but you can see like I can't get more of a mass tone. That's like as dark as it gets. Let me show, it, show you what it looked like on the first attempt. Uh, where are we? There we go. So I was definitely able to get more pigment, but it's not a color that I personally would choose to have on my palette. While I'm over here, I can show you that Lunar Earth. You can just see all that granulation separate into the paper. I like to mix this into other earth tones to give it some more of that granulating property. And we'll do English Red Earth, which should again be PR 101. Yep, another opaque version. This one is a little bit more difficult to rewet than the other PR 101s. Just an interesting observation. I usually find PR 101s to like j jump off of their pans or dried wells or wherever you're getting your paint from. This one's a little more subtle. Before we move on, I'm going to show you one over here. This is one that used to be on their dot card. This is Tear Air Colano. It used to be on their dot cards. It no longer is. It is an earth tone, but it's a convenience earth tone being mixed from PBR7 and PR101. It was really hard to rewet, so I have put some water on this dot card so we can go ahead and pick it up a little bit more easily. Although this one seems to lift much better than that first dot did. So who knows, maybe they changed something since the original dot, or maybe, maybe it's just me. Maybe I've gotten better at learning how to pick up paint. Try and get more of a mass tone here for you. It's a really lovely color, although 
I do probably have to kind of agree with their decision to remove it from the page, I guess, if it's a convenience earth tone and you've got those other ones on your, your palette already, you probably don't need this one. But I'll show you over here. It has some really beautiful granulation. You can see on the dot here that it's got more texture to it than I think either of these colors normally have on their own. Kind of like the um, Lunar Earth. All right, then we've got Quinn Burnt Scarlet. This is the one that's similar to the Garnet when it dries. Looks really intense right now, but both of the colors dry down quite a lot. Like I think all, I think all quinacridone colors, if not surely most of them, it is transparent. Then we've got Paraline Maroon. This is a gorgeous color. Look at it. It's so beautiful. Asking Paraline Maroon to not be as intense is a, is a hard ask. It's meant to be full strength and vibrant, I think. <laughs> then we've got Deep Scarlet, which is made from PR175. I don't know that I'm familiar with that pigment. Ooh, okay, no, I take back what I said about Quinacridone Sienna. And I'm gonna apply that to Deep Scarlet. <laughs> this one reminds me of Transparent Pyral Orange. It's a semi-transparent, but whew, that has some punch to it. I think this is one I'd like to try some more. I'd like to try it like kind of in place of a transparent pyrrole orange and see if it reacts the same way and mixes. It's so gorgeous. Then we have Naphthamide Maroon. This is another gorgeous color. It's similar to Paraline Violet, PV29, which, did we see that on the last chart? We did. So I'll show you those two next to each other. Miss Tiffany got me a tube of this for my birthday last year. I love it. If you do have Paraline Violet, you don't need Naphthamide Maroon or vice versa. And I don't really know how to give you advice to choose between the two. The Maroon is slightly warmer, has more red to it. But they're both beautiful deep colors and I would use them for similar purposes. So keep in mind this isn't dry yet. It's gonna dry down to be more dull and kind of more similar to this Paraline Violet. Um, both are labeled as Light Fastness 1 but not rated. It's by Daniel Smith, not ASTM. This Paraline Violet is a little bit more staining, neither granulate. Paraline Violet is rated as transparent, but when it's that dark, you're really not going to notice that that much. And now for my maroon is rated as semi-transparent, but I have not found it to be an issue in painting and it doesn't feel quite as heavy as some of the other ones that we've noted as being labeled as transparent colors that aren't. I actually just noticed when I looked over here, Lunar Earth is rated as a transparent pigment and I 100% disagree with that. You can see here where there's the heavy granulation those areas would be covered, like if it was a black line. So, curious. <laughs> then we've got Lunar Red Rock. This is another color that should granulate similarly to that Lunar Earth. It is more of that um, Venetian Red or Indian Red type hue though. It's got some deepness to it. 
although it's rated as not being as opaque as the other ones. I don't know, it feels the same to me. It feels almost identical to like the Indian red, although this might have more granulation. Should we test it? Let's test it. Wait for that to dry. Then we've got Pimentite Genuine, which I love. This has been a favorite of mine lately. It's interesting. It's a little harder to re-wet, but I haven't noticed it being a problem in like my actual painting. This is another one that granulates a lot. Let me see if I can show you it here. It's got like this really deep earthy tone and then a lighter red that kind of separates out of it. And then the brown really heavily pig uh, granulates. So it's just got this really nice tone to it. And uh, this is one that I would say that if you have an Indian red, you don't need this one as well. Or if you have this one, you don't need Indian red. They're kind of similar rolls on a palette, just like this lunar red rock. Okay, in my first video, I mentioned that I would have a little bit more to say about this. And a lot of you guys have commented and I completely understand where you guys are coming from. I'm very appreciative. A lot of you said that the the pigments that Daniel Smith used for their paints, uh, the precious stones are actually left over from the jewelry industry. So that is good to know that they're not just grinding up these minerals for, for paint. These are what would otherwise be waste products. But at the same time, the Tiger's Eye Genuine and Burnt Tiger's Eye Genuine, I mentioned in that that first video that I was really sad to see a particular color when I painted it out. And that's because I used to like, I don't know, a lot of little kids do that had a rock collection and Tiger's Eye was one of my favorites. It is a really pretty stone. I really enjoyed like my little chunks of it. But when you grind it all up, it's just kind of like a muddy, gross kind of brown color. And I don't know why I don't know why they would spend resources on making it a color, I guess, is, is my thing. I'm not judging if other people like it and want to use it. That's absolutely fine. I just personally don't find a value in it. Um, it's got like this, I don't know, like, I guess it's kind of like raw umber. but it's not quite as heavily um, in tinting strength. This is rewetting easier than the first page I did. I'll show you those as well once I have both of them out. It's just not for me, but you guys know I don't like cool browns anyway. It took me so long to add burnt umber to my palette. Trying to get me to add another one would be a very difficult task, I think. <laughs> I do like this burnt tiger's eye genuine more. Uh, it's warmer, so no surprise there, but I still feel like there's plenty of other options that rewet a little bit easier. These are rated as transparent, so I guess I could see that. And they are both series one, so it's not like you're paying a lot for these. Um, if you like those colors, go for it. Let me show you my first my first pass at them are here. So you can see they're just really hard to re-wet and I think I just didn't have a good first impression of them. And so for me personally, I've just had that in my head this whole time. Upon second swatching, they're not that bad, but I still have other choices that I would, I would prefer over them. Then we have Hematite Genuine. I had put a little bit of water on here to try and get it to 
reconstitute a bit easier, though it still looks like we're not gonna get super pigmented wash here. This is kind of a grayish color. Wants to be black, not quite there. This color does granulate quite heavily from what I know on like a proper paper. The one I was swatching out while we were waiting for the other ones is German Green Raw Umber, which is made from PBR7. This is the version of Raw Umber that some other brands carry and that it was really confusing for me when I first started using Raw Umbers because some of them were this color and some of them were dark, dark brown, which we will see later as well. I don't love this color, but I know there are other people that do. I feel like this color is very similar to the Tiger Side Genuine. This one has a bit more green in it, but they would, they would fill similar roles in the palette. Hematite Violet Genuine is going to be our hematite, but a more violet variety as the name would suggest. This reminds me a lot of Bloodstone, which I think we'll see on the next page. Or um, Shadow Violet, which we saw on the last page. Very heavily granulating color. A lot of red undertones. And then we have Mummy Bauxite, and I am curious to see what this looks like because the first swatch that I had of it, uh, I had a sample and I painted it out and I was like, all right, that's a nice color. And then I bought a tube and then the tube was a different color, like a totally different color. Um, this one has more of a brownness to it. Let's see if we can get some comparisons going. Here is what came out of my tube. But if we look over on this sheet, I know it's hard to tell because it's, oh, sorry, I can't see that at all. I know it's hard to tell because it's not on the edge, but this is a much more red pigment, whereas this is much more brown. So I don't know if this is another situation where it was just a different supply of this pigment and they switched it over at some point, but these are not the same color. And um, I had someone on Instagram confirm that their mummy box site looked more like the red and mine was more like this. They both came directly out of tubes and I wasn't just relying on the sample that someone else sent me. So it's another oddity and you're not going to be guaranteed, I don't think, on what color comes out of your tube. But as long as you know that, if you want to take a gamble anyway, you can go ahead. Permanent Brown is PBR 25. This is one of my favorite hues of an earth tone. Admittedly, I don't use it as often because I tend to use a lot of granulating colors these days. It's funny how we came to that because when I first started painting, I would have loved this color and I would have loved that it didn't granulate, but it's got this gorgeous richness to it that I just love so much. Then we have Raw Umber Violet. This is another color that I purchased after a really long time of sitting on it. I was like, oh, do I buy it? Do I not buy it? I think it was one that I picked up at the sale from my store closing and I was like, oh, I'll finally just go ahead and do it. It's a convenience color. It's raw umber mixed with PV19. And it's really, really beautiful, but I find it's just as easy to mix it uh, on your palette and it has a little bit more vibrancy if you do so. So if you don't already have this color, I would recommend just having raw umber on your palette and mixing it with a PV19. But if you want to have it as a convenience color or as your warm dark on your palette, you could do that instead of like a burnt umber, perhaps. Then we have transparent brown oxide with a streak of the lunar red rock. 
This is definitely more of a yellowy brown color. I do have this in a tube. This color um, dries down a ton. So just be aware of that, that when you get the 15 milliliter tube, if you are going to be pouring your own pans from it, there is a ton of shrinkage, more so than I think I've seen with any other color, but it is really beautiful. Wait, no, I'm sorry. That information is about a different color. It's about the environmentally friendly one, I think. Or is it this one? Uh-oh. I don't want to give you faulty information. Hold on. Okay, no, it is this one. I was right. Here's the tube of it. So I do have the transparent brown oxide. Beautiful color. It granulates super, super heavily on arches. And it's, a, it's just a gorgeous color all around. But just be aware that the volume is going to be much less once it dries down. Then we have transparent red oxide and I just recently picked up, picked up this color thanks to Otto's video where she took a look at this one and learned what a beautiful mixing color it is. It's not super impressive on its own, like it's like a lot of our other beautiful reddish earth tones, but <clears throat> Mixed with pretty much any other color, she was able to get just like this huge range of uh, jewel tones, and uh, they were just really beautiful. These are both made from PR101, both are rated as transparent, and they're series one and granulate. Here we have another PR102. I didn't realize that Daniel Smith has so many PR102s in their line. It's funny because a lot of paint companies don't have any. It's another one that would benefit from if I had left it sitting. I just didn't realize it, but we got enough worked up on it. And we have Burnt Sienna Light. I think this is PR 101. Oh, it's PR101 plus PO48. This was another new color from 2017. We talked about in the first part of this series, this video, that um, a lot of the colors that they added in 2017 were multi-pigment multi -pigment mixes because of the fact that Daniel Smith already has so many colors. It's hard to come up with new ones that are single pigment varieties, right? This is another one that's gonna be more close to your light PR-101s if you don't like their um, standard burnt sienna, kind of like this Italian burnt sienna over here. Next we have EF red iron oxide. EF stands for environmentally friendly red iron oxide. So this is similarly to the yellow one we saw earlier over here, I think, in terms of its production. It's got some opacity to it, but it's a really lovely color. I, I have a tube of this as well, and I would use it in place of a burnt sienna, but you don't need both. And then finally, we get to their just plain PBR7 Burnt Sienna. The reason, <coughs> oh my goodness, I'm sorry you guys. Got such a tickle in my throat. The reason why a lot of people don't like the Daniel Smith uh, PBR7 is because it's so different from other versions of PBR7 or Burnt Sienna. I had this as my first one, so I love this one, and that's the one I came accustomed to, and I kind of judge others against it, but if you've only used the other ones, you might be caught off guard by this one. It has more of a pink undertone usually, although I'm not really seeing that here. Did they change it? I wonder if they changed it. Hmm. I was about to tell you all this juicy information about where the origins of this version were from. Here, let me show you this here. This was the first tube that I got from them, and you can see it has a little bit more of a dullness to it. Uh, it's not quite as vibrant. It has more granulation. 
I guess this is about the same shade. Yeah, once this dries, I think it'll dry down. It just looks a little bit different wet. But it's got some pinkness to it. It's got some brownness to it. And if you want more of that orangey undertone, I'd go with one of the other versions of Sienna that they have. Then we have English Red Ochre, and this is a PR 101 as well. This is another one that's rated as transparent, but it looks semi-transparent to me. And this is um, not quite as red as some of the other PR 101 Burnt Siennas that I've seen. It kind of sits in between one of those versions and one of these other more heavy opaque versions. And finally for this page we've got Burnt Umber. This is another one that I had from the beginning as my dark brown. It's got a lot of yellow undertones, especially after looking at this whole sheet full of red earth pigments. And my favorite uh, neutral is actually instead of burnt sienna and ultramarine, I like mixing the burnt umber with ultramarine. You get a nice darker dark. And if you're looking for a softer black, that's my go-to. So we've got this whole page done. We're gonna go ahead and set it aside. We're gonna go ahead and take that stretch break because after a whole page, we need it. And then we are gonna start on the final page, which are all of the specialty colors as well as the rest of the earth tones and blacks. All right, we are on our fourth and final page. And um, we've got our other, our other sheet here on standby that we're going to be working with quite a bit. I have one more interesting tone. This is another limited edition color that they no longer make. It is a Vivanite Blue Ochre. And I had some of you say that you really, really enjoyed this color. You're sad that they don't make it anymore. I think there's a few other versions on the market, just not available from Daniel Smith. So I'll go ahead and put that here on the sheet. It's a blue gray and I don't think I have any pigment information on this one I don't know if it's a like a Primatech color and it doesn't have a number or if it has a number and I just wasn't able to find it uh, we'll have one more over here in just a little bit and then we'll move on to our shiny Hey guys, so we're going to start our fourth and final page. I'm sorry the first bit of this footage got cut off because Cricut ruined the take. Uh, thanks Cricut. <laughs> um, but we have two colors that I already swatched out. This is the final environmentally friendly brown iron oxide. This is going to be kind of comparable to your burnt umber. Um, it would fill the same role in a palette, although this version is warmer and has a little bit less yellow in it. It's got some really nice qualities to it though. It's a little bit more muted, um, has a really nice tone. Then we have our raw umber, which is our cool dark brown, has a greenish undertone. And then we're moving on to sepia. This is made from PBR7, but also has PBK9. If you are someone looking for vegan colors, you're gonna need to stay away from this one because it does have that PBR9, or PBK9, which is um, the bone black or ivory black. Uh, that's the only pigment I think that you need to worry about in Daniel Smith's line. I could be wrong. I could be forgetting one. Um, I have a vegan watercolor video if you haven't already seen it, if you're new to the channel, and that has more information. But Daniel Smith is a vegan line except for the ones that contain pigments that have non-animal friendly versions in it, and that's one of them. Then we have got Cichlorite Genuine. This is a Primatech color. It's going to take a little while to reconstitute. Looking to see if there's any other ones that I'm concerned about coming up. Maybe this one over here. All right. Van Dyke Brown is made from, it says a blend of PBR7. So it's all PBR7, but they've used different varieties of it. It's a sepia-like color, but a bit more cool, it looks like. Meow. 
Yeah, it's not dinner time yet. It's like two hours from dinner time. The time change is messing with her so bad this year. I mean, it usually affects her somewhat, but she's become a little monster by this time of day. This is Bloodstone Genuine. It's another Primatech color. It is a very soft black that granulates. This is another favorite of John Muir Laws as well, along with that quinacridone pink we looked at in the last video. Cyclorite Genuine is another color that I'm not a huge fan of. It's kind of similar to the Tiger's Eye Genuines for me, and just it has kind of this blah brown quality to it. It's not bad, it's just there's so many other options, so I don't know why you'd use this one. We're going to be disruptive and play with everything else in the room until we get fed. Is that what's happening right now? This is Lunar Violet. It is a dark bluish black that granulates. This one is made from, hold on one second, let me finish up this box and then I'll let you know. Uh, PV15, so that is um, one of our granulating violets, and PBK11. Interesting. Oh, they did put neutral tint on here. Huh. Hold on. Oh, I don't know where my sheet went. I think I threw a scrap away already. I don't think neutral tint was on their old version of the dot card, and so I had actually printed out a sticker for it over here because I had a tube of it. Um, I was going to put it over here, but it looks like we don't need that anymore because it's right there for us. So I was saying 255 in the last video, but I was double counting neutral tint, so 254. <laughs> That's how many colors I have to show you in this. But remember, two of those, three of those, four, five. Five of them are discontinued pigments. So it looks like they have an even, nope, not an even, uh, two, 249, I think. My math could be off, though. So neutral tint is a black-ish color. Um, it is made from different pigments and keeps luminosity in your colors if you mix it with others. So I love neutral tint mixed with like a cool red. It makes these really beautiful violet tones. They're really pretty in blues or even uh, with yellows, they tend to make kind of dark green type colors, which is really neat. This is made from PBK6, PB19, and PB15. So phthalo blue, um, quinacridone violet, and lamp black. Then we have graphite gray, which I can't remember who did it first. I know Schminka and Daniel Smith are the only ones that I've seen it from anyone. I don't know of other brands that have this one, but it's graphite gray. It looks like uh, pencil lead that you're painting out. It's made from PBK 10. And to me, this is like the perfect color for like an elephant. Nice, soft gray. It is very opaque though. Then we've got two different Payne's grays. The first one is one of the new colors from 2017. This is Payne's blue gray. It's going to be a more blue variety of this color, of course, given the name. And then up here, we've got Payne's Gray. That'll be a little less blue. The 
these two colors are made from. Uh, I think they're both. Oh, no, they're not. Okay. Uh, so Payne's Blue Gray is made from PB60 and PBK6. So that's Indian Throne Blue and Lamp Black. And Payne's Gray is made from uh, PB29, so Ultramarine, and PBK9. So this again has the ivory black in it if you want to stay away from that if you want vegan colors. And the Payne's Blue Gray would be a more vegan friendly option. Finally, we have Lamp Black here. Um, this is pbk6 that one that we've been talking about for a while it's a really nice matte black it's an opaque color it's pretty neutral um, if you tint it out I would say it's a little bit on the yellower side of things but it's pretty a pretty even middle black then we have Tourmaline Black Genuine. It's a Primatech color. It is a transparent black. Series 1. Granulating. This has a greenish undertone to it. And tints out to be pretty soft. Oops, didn't mean to paint over the name there. Has a little bit more of that uh, binder property to it. Some of you guys commented on the last video about thinking that the binder was from like if the color was at the top and all that does happen sometimes where you'll have more binder at the top of some colors. These dots that I've been looking at are that's not the case with them. They're mixed thoroughly. Um, it's just some pigments require more binder to kind of stay together and paint in a correct way. So when I say that a color has a little bit more of that binder feel to it. It's not the same as if I said like, oh, this paint isn't fully mixed with the binder. Um, I would definitely go ahead and let you know if that's what this looked like. You can tell the difference because if you have a dot of color and then there's like a yellowish ring around it, that is the gum Arabic that has separated out. And these colors have not done that. It's just the overall composition of the paint. So I wanted to clarify that. Here's that ivory black that I personally don't even want to swatch out. Um, I don't know why it bothers me the way that it does. Uh, I do eat some meat. I eat like uh, humanely raised chicken and things like that, but I don't really like the idea of painting with their bones. So it's just not my jam. Uh, this is a very warm black. So when you tint it out, it has yellow undertones semi-transparent, does granulate, also series one. Very flat color. Um, I actually prefer, like, even if even if you didn't have pigment information in front of me, if I had, like, if it didn't matter what they were made from, I do prefer the lamp black uh, if I'm looking at black tones because I would use, like, a sepia in spot of this warm, dark color. Finally, we have lunar black, which is that PBK11, and this is what's mixed into those lunar colors to make them granulate so heavily. It's a really pretty color. I actually like this one quite a bit. I've never purchased it for my own palette, but if I was going to buy a black, it would probably be this one. Cricket. Stop it. <sighs> Next we have our two whites and these ones. <laughs> okay, in addition to also thinking like they should put two other colors here because it could just be a 240 color chart instead of 238. I also don't think white ever needs to be included on a dot card. I mean, I guess maybe if you're really, for like the few people who really like using it, but you should at least put it over like a dark background because you can't tell anything if you have a white dot on white paper. Like that's not helpful information. So first here's the Chinese white. Chinese white is less opaque than titanium white, even though these two are rated as being the same. 
Uh, Chinese white is made from PW4, titanium white is PW6, and all of their stats, so to speak, are the same. I have gone ahead and drawn in these little Sharpie lines. I know that it's not super, super dark or like, like a big patch or anything, but it was the best that I could figure out to make these still look um, kind of presentable as swatch cards. I worried if that box got too big, it would start to look a little messy. And some of these other rows, like the paint doesn't always line up in the same spot. So just for the evenness of things, that's what I went with. Um, Chinese white seems like more of a mixing white to me. This titanium white is a little bit more yellowed. And while PW6 is usually more transparent, as I mentioned, they do look about the same. So their ratings match up there. Next, it, we're going to be doing something that I've not done before. My former dot card, uh, I did not swatch these out at all because I just didn't have any interest in them. I've got them all here and um, I had cut up these slots so that I could go ahead and make the other dot cards. Whew, that sentence was not a sentence with great <laughs> grammatical structure. Let's try again. So I had the old dot card and I needed to pull these colors from them because they're no longer on the new dot card and I wanted to show you all of the colors. I believe that all of these are still available on the website. I don't think they stopped making them, although it could be wrong. So I cut up the old chart, put the applicable ones here, and we're gonna go ahead and swatch them out. Some of these colors are best seen over black surfaces and some are can be either way. And it'll be interesting to see how they look over this dotted line versus not. So I'm excited to kind of finally take a look at them and give them a chance. Uh, we had one of our viewers, Marty, who recently sent me some tubes of them. I haven't gotten to play with them yet, but thank you, Marty, for sending me a couple of these. So that if we decide we like them, we can play with them here. I did realize that I forgot to put black lines on this sheet, so let me go ahead and do that and I'll be right back. All right, I am gonna prep these with some water because it does take them a little while to, to soften up. Uh, I will say also that I think these colors are more for like crafters and card makers and things like that because a lot of them, like I mentioned before, are suited to being on dark paper and they show up better on dark paper, which isn't very commonly seen in watercolors. It's not impossible. There are uh, some companies that make black watercolor paper, um, but for the most part, a lot of these colors will be more helpful in those areas for like calligraphy or things like that. Um, I honestly, hold on before I start painting this out, let's go ahead and flip over our chart because that's important. And it doesn't really say here. I was going to see if there was any indication on the chart about the different names. So there's duochrome, which I do know are two different colors based on how you view them. The interference colors, I believe you're supposed to put on black paper. Like they look almost white if they're on white paper, but they look different if they're on dark paper. And then we also have our iridescent colors. Almost all of these have white mixed into them. And then it looks like it really depends on the pigments or it depends on the color for the pigments. So I'm not gonna go ahead and read off any of this information while we're doing them because I don't think it'll be super helpful, but I hope that you guys enjoy. Let me zoom in a little bit more so you can see some of the, the glitter, hopefully. This first one is called Duochrome Oceanic. Got that nice seafoam green type color. Definitely shows up well on the white sheet for this one. You can see a little bit more of the gold over the black and um, I'll show you guys that at the end once they dry a little bit more. We have duochrome blue pearl. That does look like blue pearl to me. It's a very faint blue. Still a little hard to re-wet even after that water drop was sitting on them. It's a very bright blue color. And we have duochrome turquoise. A 
This is kind of in between the last two that we saw. It's a little greener than the blue pearl, but I would still call this a blue. Kind of like a cobalt teal color with an iridescent quality to it. I'm also going to go ahead, there's a duochrome over on this sheet. So we'll prep our little side sheet over there. We'll scooch to the top of this page that have already been soaking. And we've got duochrome Cabo Blue. This is a warmer blue tone. Ooh, and this one looks really different over the black. So on white, it looks blue. And over the black, it looks gold. Can you guys see that? I think you can see that. It's the first one that's been really different between the two surfaces. We have duochrome aquamarine. They're very big on these blue colors in the duochrome line. This one's really hard to re-wet though. This one is almost fluorescent. It's labeled as being light fast though, so. Must just be that nice blend. This one is like a teal color on the white and then it's a deeper blue over the black line. Do duochrome emerald. This definitely looks like a phthalo blue type of color mixed with the white, and I don't see a big difference between the white and the black. I'm gonna go ahead and pull this into view for you. Duochrome green pearl. This is another one that doesn't really change. I think it's a little more silvery versus the green over that black line, but not a whole lot of difference. We've got duochrome. Oh, I should have done this before I went over there. We gotta, we gotta prep some more. I don't want to prep them too far in advance. I'll go ahead and do this one. I dropped water on this earlier when I did the blue one. It's not quite in the range that we're in yet color-wise, but this is Duochrome Violet Fantasy. And guys, I don't see anything. I don't know if it's gonna change as it dries. I don't even see anything over the black, really. I mean, there's... Okay, when you tilt it, there's an angle where you can see a very faint purple, but I don't really understand it. Maybe just over black paper, you could get a really soft um, shimmery color, but not super impressed with that one. Okay, duochrome bronze, uh, desert bronze. I think this is one, yeah, this is one of the tubes that was sent to me. Okay, this one feels like the name duochrome, okay? It's a brown color, but in the right light, it has a green shimmer, and over that black line, it's also a green shimmer. So that makes more sense to me with the naming. Kind of like um, these two up here, the Duochrome Aquamarine and Cabo. Those look pretty different in terms of two colors. And then we've also got this Duo Desert Bronze that's green and brown at the same time. Then we've got Seguro Green. Okay, this is another one that is brown and green at the same time. It's lighter in tone though.
Duochrome Adobe. seen a huge duochrome I see like a peachy color as the main tone and there's a more vibrant pink that kind of goes over that but it's not drastically different um, autumn mystery is next I've heard a lot of good things about this one a lot of people like this color it's kind of like a salmony pinky orange I'd be curious to read the descriptions, like Otto reads the descriptions on her videos for a lot of her series. And a lot of these uh, specialty colors are like really romanticized or built up. I'm curious to know what they say about some of them. Duochrome Cactus Flower. This is another one of the tubes that I have. It looks purple, but the tube color looks pink. So let's see what it looks like when it comes out here. Hmm. It's kind of like a really soft lilac color. I'm kind of curious since I have the tube here. I'm going to go ahead and open it and we're going to go ahead and put fresh paint and see if that's different. I have a feeling a lot of these paints are going to be different from the tube and I would recommend that if you use metallic colors just use them from the tube. That's so different, so different from the tube. I don't even know if that's the same color. Is it still manufactured the same way? You can see on the tube, the focus is that there is a pink and a purple. Like, you can see that on the dried paint there. Hmm, it's interesting. I don't know how I feel. I don't know if I like it better from the tube or not. But it's it's interesting. Then we have duochrome hibiscus. This is a pink that has a bluish purple undertone and over that black line. That one might be hard to see under the studio lights. All these might be a little hard to see under the studio lights. I'll tilt it for you once we're done with the page. Then we have duochrome violet pearl. So the other sheet we had violet fantasy that was basically like a non color. This one is really pretty though. This is definitely a violet. You guys, I don't know. Am I like, am I not seeing it? I don't get it. This color is, there's actually kind of a greenish undertone to it. There's no violet anywhere though. I don't see violet. I don't know. Okay. We've got mauve, tropic sunrise, Lapis Sun Light, Duochrome Arctic Fire, and then we have Interference Colors after that. This one kind of reminds me of the Cactus Flower when we first painted it out. I'm really confused by the cactus flower. I kind of want to like test it again. I feel like this might have been unfair. I don't know. I'm waiting for the water drops on the main page to soak in because I don't think they're doing a great job of that. So let's try this one more time. Cap back on. It's 
a thick color. Okay, this looks brown with like a violet overtone. Curious to see how that dries, but that's completely different from like the mauvey purple color that is down here. So I don't really understand, but maybe this brown tone like doesn't reconstitute very well. Just another reason to paint with these iridescent colors from the tube and not dried samples. If you guys haven't heard me yet, um, I know I've been really stubborn about gouache over the last year or so and like, oh, I want gouache that I can pour into a palette and leave there because I don't like fiddling with the tubes, but I did finally give in to that and just realize how much better they are from the tube. So if I want to paint with gouache, I need to be willing to go from the tube. It's not worth it otherwise for most brands. Tropic Sunrise doesn't look like a lot. Um, there's a bit of a greenish yellow cast over that black line. Lapis Sunlight. We've got kind of like a bluish green. This is kind of similar to the Violet Fantasy where there's not really a lot of color, but I can see some color over that black line. Arctic Fire, I would hope that this has like an orange or red cast to it. Let's see. Are we talking blue flames here? Oh, not much going on. Well, those are the duochrome colors, folks. Let me zoom out a little bit so we can take a look at those real quick. So don't lose your tension spans. Here's kind of like the hue mass tone. And then if we tilt up, we can see that iridescence. Mass tone, iridescence. I'm gonna get rid of this little sheet of paper. I don't think I need it anymore. Interference Blue is up next. This is definitely a different color over the black. You can kind of see it. Uh, oh, let me zoom you guys back in. If you look at this this line next to this line. This is the black. And that's what it looks like with this paint over it. So it's white on white paper, but if you put it on the black, it's a beautiful blue tone. Same for the interference gold. It's gold over that black line. Mostly white otherwise. Interference green. Okay, these are all pretty true to the name. You have to have that black underneath them. But they are the colors that they are claiming to be once you go on top of them. Let me go ahead and make sure that this dot card is prepped. We've got red, copper, and silver in that line. Uh, here we've got lilac. This is a really pretty pinky purple color over that black line. Oh, those are pearlescent colors. So let's finish up the interference ones over here. So these ones are the ones that are available on the website, but not available on the dot card anymore. Silver, that first one. Copper. And 
and red. I wonder how I'm gonna scan these ones for you guys. I hope it works. I might have to just take pictures of them. Oh, oh, I saw a tiny hint of violet here. It's really hard to catch. <laughs> Teeny tiny glimmer. I still don't get it though. All right, here's that cactus flower tea that we were waiting to dry over here. No, I'm bouncing around a lot, guys, sorry. It looks purple in the glob, and then there's a purple shimmer, but it's mostly that brown color. Oh, what an odd duck. Okay, pearlescent shimmer. This one certainly looks the shiniest out of all of these samples. Got some serious spark going on. I don't know for sure without looking at the website, but this looks like a color you would mix in with other colors or paint or glaze over the top of an existing painting. Like you'd add it to your painting in a glaze since it's a transparent color to make it shimmer from below. We have pearlescent white. Same thing. This white is a softer texture like some of the other colors we've been looking at so far. Whereas the shimmer has like really big noticeable metallic properties to it. Let me turn down the exposure here and see if that helps at all. You see the shimmer has much bigger particles. All right, iridescent colors are next. Moonstone is the first one. That really wet pretty well. Hasn't even been sitting that long. This is just what I would call silver though. Guess you want it to sound a little fancier. I wouldn't call it transparent though. Actually, I wouldn't call most of these colors transparent. Otto talks about this in her series too, but like if you can see it over the black line, that means it's not transparent, right? I don't know. <laughs> um, this is a nice like slate gray silvery type color. Then we have blue silver. I like this one. I don't know why I've never thought to like go to Daniel Smith for iridescent colors. Like I've I've had my interest peaked a bit in like the fine tech palettes and I actually purchased one of them and actually was disappointed with it. Uh, so you guys haven't seen it yet here on the channel. I'm gonna try and play with it more and maybe do a video in the future. Um, but both Schminka and Daniel Smith have apparently very beautiful metallic colors that I just haven't looked at very much. But then again, I don't paint subjects that require metallic colors very often. This next one is Iridescent Sunstone. That's a really pretty color. It's subtle, but nice. Aztec Gold. And I'm just trying to imagine, and I want you guys to try and imagine too, what these would look like in full strength because the dot cards of metallic colors are never going to completely reconstitute to the strength that you could get from the tube. So just keep that in mind. Got bronze. This is a good one. This has a lot of coverage. Absolutely would not call it transparent. <laughs> I like this one a lot though. So this is your very warm brown, and then this is still a warm brown, but more yellow. Or, sorry, gold, don't know why I said brown. Very warm brown, like a rose, oh my gosh, I did it again. Rose gold, there we go. 
and this is more of a, like a warm bright gold then we have iridescent oh hold on let's do um goldstone over here so they have iridescent gold that we'll get to in a moment but iridescent gold stone is what I think of this is kind of like when I had my rock collection I told you guys about the gold or pyrite the fit fool's gold looked like this color it's a very cool opaque gold all right so then we have copper it's gonna be a reddish color like a penny fresh penny And their regular gold. Oh boy. There's not much in this sample. I'm not going to be able to get a really good sample going on here for you. I'll try and push it over the black line the best I can so that you can see it in close to full strength in terms of its coverage. Topaz, this is the third tube that was sent to me. My mom's birthstone is Topaz. This looks like a very green variety. Rather than like a brownish color. Although it is a soft brown, like a earthy brown. I do like that one. Then we have iridescent jade, which should be, I would assume, a little bit brighter green. This one kind of reminds me more of the duochrome line than the iridescence from what I've seen so far. Very soft, subtle color on the white with more of an intense shine on the black line. Let me go ahead and prep this side, getting to the end here. Just got our russet. Okay, here's iridescent garnet. Ooh, this has been sitting for a while and it's still hard to get any kind of pigment up. Poor little brush. It's pretty, but I don't think I would call that color garnet. Um, it's much more of a pink tone compared to the other garnets that we've seen on their other page. It's just an interesting choice. Here is iridescent russet. This is closer to what I would think a garnet would be. Painted over the edge, a little sloppy. Final row. And the final colors, we're done with the other swatch sheet, the bonus one, so these are what is left. Iridescent Ruby. Again, not the color I would associate with a ruby. It's a little bit more purple, but it's pretty. Both this color and the rest that we just did remind me a lot of the colors from the Fine Tech palette I mentioned earlier. Ooh, this one looks fun. Iridescent Scarab Red. The dot looks kind of a greenish gray, but when we paint it out, we've got this dual color. I think this color is also in that Fine Tech palette. It's called like Mystery or something, where it's like a red color, but looks green in its mass tone.
be curious to see those next to each other. Iridescent electric blue, and it is electric. That is for sure. That is some bright blue. Sapphire. Hmm, maybe. Seems more lavender to me. Antique bronze. So that's kind of neat. They did put um, the iridescent bronze and the antique bronze next to each other, and they put the iridescent copper and the antique copper next to each other. This feels a little bit more like a penny. I like that one. It's got some richness to it. And finally, we've got antique gold and antique silver. <laughs> this is the color I don't like. It's like a greenish gold that I've never found attractive either in jewelry or in paint. It looks a little bit like you spilled like gold powder on like a newsprint to me. And silver. This one though looks pretty. I like this one. Okay. It looks like that will do it. Let's take a look at these iridescent colors. So here are the mass tones and the shimmer. And the mass tones and the shimmer. Zoom me out. See more of those overall. Tilt back and forth a couple more times. I know it can be hard to catch the right tone for the one that you're looking for. Hopefully my camera is doing an okay job at picking them up. We've completed our little chart over here. And we are done swatching out every single Daniel Smith watercolor that are currently available. So I hope that you guys liked this two-part video. If you are looking for other Swatch With Me videos, be sure to check out the playlist that has those in them. Stay tuned because I'm redoing a lot of the Swatch With Me series on cotton paper since the first round was mostly on uh, Arteza paper, which is not a great quality. So um, I look forward to sharing these with all my patrons over on Patreon in high scan format. I hope that they helped to inform you, make some buying decisions, and um, thank you guys for watching. I'll see you in the next video, and until next time, happy painting.